Good morning. <laughs> good morning, good morning. <clears throat> um, <laughs> good morning. So glad you are here this morning. Um, I am Laura Lynn, and Clay is absolutely right. I do love awkward. Um, I learned a long time ago um, that um, I have an incapacitating fear of awkward moments. Um, and so that really keeps me from like stepping into new things because I'm like, what am I, I'm going to panic and it's going to be weird and awkward. And so um, I actually uh, <laughs> took a year of my life. This was not my message, but we're just going to share this. Um, I actually decided that uh, one year I was like, you know what? I, this is really keeping me from experiencing a lot of, a lot of life. And I'm tired of that. And so it was right around my birthday, and I said, you know what? This is going to be the year of no fear. I'm going to step in, and I'm going to say yes to the things that are hard. And, um, <clears throat> and boy, did I do that that year. It was really fun. But that was one of the things that I learned. It's a very minor thing, but it's very significant. So here's a tip. We've already done the mingle time, but for next week. The tip is, if something is awkward, if you feel awkward, the number one best way to diffuse that is to say, this is awkward. If you just name it and you step into it, I don't know what it is because it's almost like this collective like, ah, it is, and then you can move forward. So next week, maybe that's how we'll start the greet time. Hello, my name is, and this is awkward, and then you can move from there. Although you guys are doing really well, so I feel like I interrupted you as you were getting to know each other, um, which is great. Anyway. It's good to be together. Thanks for being here this morning. It is rainy and cold. Fall is here. Um, and I'm excited about it. Maybe not that it's cold, but I'm excited that um, it's a change of season. So it um, means good, good things are coming. Um, well, last week, Mike actually uh, started a new series called Available. And it's focusing, we're, we're focusing in this series on uh, one of the four things that we hope for everyone who's a part of Port City Community Church. So uh, this is that we hope that you are leveraging your life for impact in the kingdom of God. We hope that first and foremost, you have a relationship with God, that every single person who's a part of our church family has a personal relationship with God. We hope that you are engaged in formative community because you can get really lost in a room this big with this many people. And we want you to be known and we want you to know um, because you are a part of this community. And so we hope that you're engaged in a formative community, which means in part that it's probably a smaller community. <clears throat> We hope that you're active in service, because also part of our formation into the way of Jesus, into the person of Jesus, is serving and offering ourselves um, to others. And then, we also hope that you are leveraging your life for impact. And so Mike uh, rounded out his message last week um, with this sanity prayer, sort of a sanity declaration that he gave us, uh, where he says, God uses me. And I think that's, it's so simple and it's so powerful that God uses me, that God uses me, and God uses me. And I hope that you've said that this week. I hope that you've emphasized each individual word to feel the power of that. Um, but if we are going to uh, make available, we, we defined uh, leveraging as making available anything that we have for anything God wants to do. And so if we're going to make anything available that we have, we have to start by knowing what that is, don't we? Um, so that's what we're going to talk about this morning. And uh, yeah, so I'd love to get into it. Let's start in Romans 12. We talked about this last week. Um, if you have your Bibles, you can open to Romans 12. It will be on the screen. It's also in your handout if you got one of those. Lots of varieties of ways to get there. But in Romans, what we, where we pick up is that Paul is, um, is telling the church in Rome that um, because of what Christ has done for us, he has given us the, um, the opportunity to be new creatures in a new creation. And this is good news because it is now available for every person. Um, and so that is good news, in fact. And so therefore, in light of that, he says, this is how we should then respond. And so this is where we pick up um, at the very beginning, verse 1, chapter 12. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. 
Then you will be able to, uh, to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So I love that he starts by saying, therefore, in response to God's kindness, in response to his goodness to us, therefore, uh, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice. In light of his mercy, offer your body. Not just your money, not just your time, not just your Sunday morning, but all of you, all that you have, all that you are, everything that God has given you, offer all of that as a living sacrifice. Um, Eugene Peterson, in, who uh, translated the message version, says it this way. He says, take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. In Luke 10, uh, it's said this way, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your strength, and with all of your mind, your whole self. Love the Lord your God with your whole self, with all that you have, and offer it, um, offer it up to him, a sacrifice that is holy and pleasing to God. So holy um, is sacred, it's set apart, it's an offering that is, that is um, especially distinctly for God, and it's pleasing to God. And he says, this is your true worship. So what this means is that as we live our everyday ordinary lives, we are worshiping in how we live. We're honoring God with how we live, with everything that he gave us, so that when we come in here on Sunday mornings um, and we gather together, as Maggie said, when we're proclaiming with our mouth the goodness of God, we're doing that together, but we've already come in worshiping. We don't come in here to worship. We come in here already worshiping because of the way that we're living, because we've offered our body as a living sacrifice. Let's keep reading. So verse three, uh, he says, for by the grace given me, uh, this is Paul, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Okay, so something that I think is super interesting is that um, Paul's saying, for by the grace given to me, I'm gonna tell you, to think of yourself. <laughs> and that is um, not something that we hear often in church. I think that historically, the Western church specifically, in our effort to, um, to honor God and his holiness and to mark the difference between us, uh, the creation and the creator, that we've really developed this theology that, uh, that we are worthless as people. And um, I actually, even one time, I lived in Colorado for a while, and there was a church out there, um, which hopefully none of you were part of, maybe you were, glad you're here, um, but it's called Scum Church, and um, I thought that was super interesting. Can you imagine Scum Community Church? Um, and while I, I think I understand the heart behind that, um, I, think, I think I get that, I do respectfully disagree, because Scum, <laughs> or a zero level, um, is not where we started. We have been created by God. And that alone gives us worth. And then, not only that, uh, distinct from the rest of creation, we've been created in God's image. And that makes us especially worthy. And then, uh, we've been created in God's image and we have been purposed so he designs us in his image and then he says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to actually increase and to multiply, to keep creating. And then I want you to uh, share in my authority over the rest of creation, to rule and to reign with God the creator under his ultimate authority, but to rule over the rest of creation. That is all meaningful. <laughs> That's not nothing. Um, that is the design and that is the intention. As we know, at the very beginning, though, we didn't trust God. We didn't trust his goodness. Uh, we didn't trust him at his word. And so sin entered the world, and it brought death into every relationship that we're designed to have. So there's, there's a death and a brokenness in our relationship with God. There is a brokenness in our relationship with each other. <laughs> we feel that. There's a death and a brokenness in our relationship with the rest of creation. And there is a brokenness in our relationship with ourselves how we see ourselves. Um, 
But God, God so loved the world that he created, that he gave the life, the death, and the resurrection of his one and only son, so that anyone who would choose to trust him, who would choose to believe in him, who would choose to believe that he has the power to, uh, to overcome death of any kind, would not perish but have eternal life. That's good news. And that's the design. And that's for us. Therefore, in light of God's mercy, let us offer our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to him. And let's think of ourselves. Do think of ourselves. And Paul says, but think of yourself with sober judgment, or sound judgment is another way of saying that. So don't think of yourself as more or less, but in light of, um, in light of the faith that God has given you, in light of who God is, in light of how he's created you, think of yourself with sober judgment. You know, I do think um, it's worth mentioning that it honors the Lord when we live into who we are and when we celebrate how we've been designed. Because what that does is that actually points back to him as our creator, and that gives him glory. So to think less of ourselves is actually dishonoring to the one who created us. Yes, sin is in the world, but... God is greater, and God, has, God is working toward redeeming all things, and he's made this available to us. But so at the end of verse 3, it says, uh, think of yourself as sober judgment in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. Um, so what I hear here is, is there's intention in God's design, in his distribution of what he's given to each of us. Um, so there's intention. All of these things, we're starting to see a theme. Okay, last chunk of Romans 12, uh, verses 4 through 6. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all of the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. And then Paul goes on to say, if this is your gift, do that. And if this is your gift, do that. If this is your gift, do it. If you have been given a gift, don't just hold it. Do it. Do it with all that you have. But we have different gifts. His intention in his distribution, there's intention in his distribution and purpose in his design for us because we are meant to come together and work together as a whole. So Paul tells us to think of ourselves, which again, I think feels a little bit weird to say in the church. But again, not too much, not too little. And I wonder if there's some of us in this room who uh, maybe or maybe in this room we fall into two main camps. I'll, I'll create a spectrum so that we're not just <clears throat> dichotomizing this. But maybe some of us in this room think um, too much of ourselves or think, think of ourselves too much. Maybe that's a better way to say it. And so uh, that's really where our minds are consumed. And so um, maybe we could, we could do with a little bit of swinging that pendulum to the center. Or maybe there's some of us who are feeling like, um, I do not want to sit and think about myself. I have no desire to reflect. I don't need to go into those deep places. I'm fine with um, what I need to do. Um, and so this concept of journaling or reflecting or anything like that maybe just gives you a little cringe. Um, and that's okay. But Paul says it's a worthy exercise to do this. It's worth your time because when you know how you've been designed, uh, when you understand more of who you are and what's in you, it gives you a clue to how God has purposed you, um, what his intention is for the part that you'll play um, in partnering with him in the work of redemption, the part that you'll play as a part of the body of the whole. So <clears throat> where do we begin with this? Um, I wanted to share one tool. I think there's a lot of ways. I, I love to, to use all kinds of tools and assessments for self-awareness or for um, you know, personal development, team development, and that's actually a huge piece of what I get to do here, and I love it, because um, it feels like a treasure hunt to figure out who people are and how God has designed them. Um, but one tool I wanted to, uh, to bring to you this morning is, um, it's from a counseling class that I took, but it's called the Johari Window. Um, and uh, it was founded by two psychologists whose names are Joe and Harry, and that's how it's, he, it got its name, and that is a fact. Um, and it was uh, created in uh, mid-50s, 1952. And so it's a tool, again, to help us just figure out all the different pieces of who we are. So let's sort of break this down a little bit. 
Okay, so in this top quadrant, there's information about me that, that I know. I'm well aware of, of some of these things about myself. Um, and some of this information, you are also aware about me. Uh, so for instance, um, if you are looking at me right now, you can see that I am a woman and I have curly hair. And that information is out in the open, and you can see that. Um, if, um, if you've been here for a little while, you may know that I really like plants. And I mentioned that one time, and I have had so many great conversations with so many of you ever since. So that is information that is in the open area, as we'll call it. This is common knowledge, um, something that I know about me and that you know about me. So that's out there. And then there's information that, uh, is, that I know about me, but that you don't. And so this is, we'll say this is in the hidden space. This is hidden information. And there could be a lot of reasons for why you don't know this information about me. One could be that I just haven't had the opportunity to tell you that. We just don't know each other very well. Um, another could be that maybe I don't know how to tell you this stuff about me. Or um, maybe I am embarrassed to tell you some of this information. Or I'm ashamed of some of these things. Uh, or maybe I'm just too proud to actually admit some of these things. Um, also, to be fair, there are some things that you don't need to know about me. I uh, don't think that we need to tell everything to everyone. <laughs> but I do think um, we want to be known. This is our design. Uh, we want to know and be known. And so we get to determine what that is. But anyway, so that's down in the hidden area. The stuff that I know, but you don't. Okay, so on the other side of that, there's information about me that I don't know. Um, but that you do know about me. There could be something that you are very aware, uh, well aware of right now about me that I am not. Um, one thing I would like to exhort our church to is this, an example of this would be like if I had spinach in my teeth right now, I would hope that someone would offer that to me and make me aware of that. I do think in the world there are two types of people, the ones who will tell you and be your friend and then the ones who won't out of selfishness because it could be awkward. And I would like to challenge you today. I'm one of those people, I will always tell you, I will be your friend even if I don't know you. I'll tap you on the shoulder. Hey, just, just because I hate for you to go on the rest of your day without knowing. So anyway, so that is something that would be a blind spot. Um, also blind spots are, are you know, behaviors, patterns, things like that, that, um, that you can see that I can't see, things that I am unaware of. Um, I was uh, talking through my message with Clay um, in preparation for this, and uh, I made a comment like, oh, I just, I don't want to be too vague about this, and da 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 da, and he just kind of chuckled a little bit, and he said, Laura Lynn, I don't, I, I don't think that you um, know how to be vague. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's true. I do ask a lot of questions. I like a lot of clarity. Um, and also, my face gives everything away. So if I'm still thinking or wrestling with something, you're probably going to know exactly what it is based on my face. And so uh, I thought that that was a funny um, little piece to learn about myself. Um, OK, so we've got blind spots. And then we've got information that I don't know about me and that you don't know about me. And this is unknown. And uh, this is like, this screams to me potential. Because there's a whole world of discovery. We don't yet know fully who we are or who we will be. And we're going to change in any given season. And so there's always more to discover. Um, and so there's lots of ways we can get to this information um, in terms of discovering uh, more, more richly, more deeply, more clearly who we are. Um, but there is information about who we are that's unknown. So there's a lot to know. There's a lot to think about. Um, hopefully this isn't overwhelming, but hopefully it sort of breaks it down to some different categories for you. But the question is, so, so what do we do with this? How do we actually get to it? Um, so <clears throat> part of knowing and being known is uh, that there's a responsibility. I have a responsibility. Um, if I know something and you don't, it's my responsibility to share that, to offer that to you, to bring something um, out of within me, I guess, um, to offer it and to bring it into the light. Um, and that could be just that I need to be humble enough to share something with you, or um, maybe I need the courage um, to offer something like a hurt or a brokenness, or um, if there's shame. We think of the fact that uh, shame, you know, grows in the dark, they say. 
And so if we can offer that and bring it out into the light, then it's something that can be used. Because everything in every single quadrant here is something that God wants to use. It's all something that we can offer to him. And so what we want to do is we want to, we want to figure out what that is, and we want to be able to offer it. But sometimes if it's so hidden, um, it's maybe not quite ready to be used, but the first step would be to bring it into the light. And so we do that by, um, by offering, by telling it to someone, to a trusted friend, um, but to, to share something or to speak something so that it, it, um, <laughs> you don't have the power of the pride that can come with it um, by keeping it within you. Um, but uh, so that's where we, we would offer something. If there's something that uh, I don't know about myself, but you do, you do in my blind spots, that, the responsibility is on me to ask. So I'm offering something, and I'm asking, and I'm going after it and saying, and again, to a trusted friend, um, you know, hey, what do you see in me? What, what, do you, what behaviors are you seeing that you don't think I'm aware of? And sometimes I think that our tendency is to think this is only negative stuff. I do think, you know, that's part of it. But I think also, um, have you had someone ever say to you, you know, hey, I see that you're really good at this. You really have a knack for that. You seem to really have a skill to know how to do this or that. We, um, we need to draw that out of one another. <laughs> and so, um, so sometimes, you know, it's asking someone uh, with humility to say, hey, what do you see in me? And then it's also the humility to receive whatever that is. Um, but again, we want to bring it into the light so that we're aware of it so that we can offer it um, back to the Lord. Um, <clears throat> and then for things that are unknown, um, again, I think that's just like a, a huge space of potential. I think there's so many ways that you can get to, uh, to, to figuring out what you don't know. Again, I think you can use assessments, you can use um, all kinds of tools that offer language for us to think about how we think <laughs> or how we act or how we make decisions or the things that we seem to have a natural capacity for. Um, so I think tools, uh, all types of tools are, are super helpful in that way. Um, but also, I think I like to tell people sometimes to figure out what you're good at, you got to just try stuff. Have you ever thought you're really good at something um, or even told people, hey, yeah, I'm really good at that. And then you try it and you're like, hmm. Turns out she's not. Um, but you only know that by trying it. And so I think um, you got to do stuff. You got to be around different people. You got to put yourself in a different situation to see how you respond. Um, if you think you, you know who you are in this context, and this context has never changed, I venture to say that's not the fullness of who you are. So try a different context. Try some different people. Try some different conversations. Try some new things and see who you are, what's consistent in all of those, um, in all of those contexts, in all of those arenas. This is also why, you know, Mike was saying last week that to leverage our life for impact really requires, requires a posture of curiosity. Um, curiosity for who am I? Curiosity for what is God doing in me? What is he doing around me? What is he doing through me? What has he done through me? Um, it's a posture, and I think that's important. And so when I look at this, the other thing that I also see is just the absolute necessity of community. And I'm not saying that just because I'm the director of community here. Um, but I really think, like, you cannot do this in a vacuum. You cannot know who you are um, sitting in a room by yourself or just in your own head. We need each other. We need to ask. We need to tell. We need to discover together. We need to discern. We need to draw out. Uh, we need to bring things into the light so they can find healing so that we can then offer those things back to the Lord. Um, actually, you can offer them before they're healed. He's the one that will heal, right? Um, so we need community, and all of this takes place. All of this takes place in the context of formative community. It's going to require a little bit of self-reflection. Um, I'm not saying you have to journal. I am saying that's one way to get there. Um, it's going to require doing things, using tools, and most importantly, back to what I said at the very beginning of my time here, um, it's going to require that you walk with the one who created you. Um, there, this puts so much emphasis on, on our walk with God. He is the one who designed us, and he created us, and he purposed us. So let's ask him, what did you do? Who did you make? What do you want me to do? 
and let him reveal through all of these different avenues. Um, okay, so once you've done that, and we have a better idea and a better understanding of who we are, um, what do we do with that? <laughs> I, think, uh, I think that culturally, um, we're taught that self-awareness is sort of the highest achievement, that that's the ultimate goal, is to know yourself. Um, but I think that if we only accumulate all of this knowledge and all of this self-awareness, self then we start to look a little bit like this, which is a child's drawing of a person with a very disproportionate head. And that's not what we're going for, right? We don't want to just walk around and be people with, you know, a ton of self-awareness, but actually know um, <laughs> what do we do with it. It's just sitting in our head. It's great that you're aware of yourself, but what are you going to do with that? Uh, we, want to, we want to be whole people. Um, and I keep thinking of that verse, and I probably should have looked up where it's from, but it says, you know, um, knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And, um, and so we have the opportunity to take this knowledge and to do something with it. Um, and so Paul tells us here in Romans that the way of Jesus is to know ourselves so that we can then offer it back to God um, and that we can trust him with anything that we make available. So we're aware of it, we know it, and now I know it, he can use it if I'm willing to offer it. And when we do that, I have to say that uh, <laughs> what's going to happen is that we're going to find ourselves um, offering it back in the context of community. Because remember, he says, uh, you, we are all part of a body that's made up, we're one body made up of many parts, and each part belongs to each other. Um, we have a different function that we serve within the body. And so um, this is going to point us right back to how we can use our gifts um, in light of, of the community that we're a part of. God did not design us. I don't believe it was his intention that we are well-rounded people. I say this a lot in my, uh, the workshops that I get to do. Um, I think our culture tells us that, that we want to be well-rounded people. Um, but actually, God's design is that we collectively are a well-rounded people, that we are a body um, made up of many different parts that he has distributed to each of us. So we know ourselves to offer ourselves, uh, to offer anything we have for anything that God wants, and that's leveraging our life for impact. Um, this year, um, ironically, my one word um, has been offering, um, I thought that was interesting as I was preparing to just share today, and um, I will offer you this. I have not been very diligent with it. Um, I've not really done a ton with it, which maybe I should be doing more, um, but I'm not great at always keeping it in front of me. But, uh, but I have remembered from time to time that this was the word that I chose to use as my lens for, for 2023 um, to look at what God is doing, to, uh, to maybe try to understand or just to to observe and to see what God is doing in me and through me and around me. Um, and it's been pretty interesting. I actually found an old text message um, in my phone that I sent to a friend back in March um, who had asked about my word. Uh, and this is what I said. In Matthew 6, when Jesus is talking about treasures, he says, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. By healthy, here, he means generous. I know that in context, he's talking about financial stewardship, but I want to think about that in relation to all that God has given me. Money is actually the easiest thing for me to be generous with. It's my time, my energy, my gifts, and my skills that I'm more stingy with. I've been stuck on the verse where it says that Jesus looked out on the crowds and had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so at the end of a long day of pouring himself out, he saw people who needed help. And so he offered himself. I suppose the gist of it is this, that I want to be abundantly generous with all that I have and all that I am. I see that in Jesus. But many things keep me from doing that. Selfishness, fear, doubt, selfishness. I want my whole body to be full of light. I suppose I could have chosen the word generous, but I think it begins with an offering. And so, 
<clears throat> as I looked back um, on the last 10 months uh, through the lens of offering, I see that this year, God has been doing something very specific. He has used <clears throat> people and opportunities and experiences um, and just even his spirit to reveal to me uh, several things about my design and how he has gifted me and I think what he has purposed me to do. Um, I think that he has, he has been calling out, I think, a pastoral calling for me. And that's a weird thing to say out loud because I'm not really fu fully sure that I'm ready to admit it. Um, but I think enough things are pointing to it uh, that it's, um, there's something to it. I have to pay attention to it, right? So I was thinking the other day, feeling really uh, a weight of that, of even just the title of pastor and what that could mean uh, for me and what that looks like. And I was feeling a little anxious, actually, and so um, I was trying to lean into the anxiety so as not to give it more power than it deserves and thinking, okay, why, what about this, you know, makes me feel anxious? What makes me feel nervous? And the reality is, is that uh, I know a fraction of what, uh, of the sacrifice that will be required with simply just the title pastor, um, let alone what God may, may ask of me or call me into. And the reality is, is that uh, I'm not sure if I'm ready to offer that. <laughs> that's, that's um, yeah. I'm not sure if I'm ready because of um, selfishness, fear, doubt, more selfishness. Um, but God has revealed this to me, and he has, uh, I think, purposed to me. And so now I'm at the point where the question before me is, um, what will I offer? With all that he's revealed to me this, this year, and in, in the past years even, knowing what I know now, um, what will I do with what I know about who I am? That's the question before me. What am I going to do with it? He's taken this year specifically to reveal it. Um, what will I offer? And as I was thinking through that, um, you know, just thinking of what he might be asking of me or what that could mean. I don't even know fully what that means. It, I, I remembered, it really did occur to me that it was, it's in view of God's kindness, in view of God's mercy, in view of God's goodness and his faithfulness, in view of his design and his intent his invitation for me to be a part of it, if I'm willing. Is he not worthy of my sacrifice? Of anything that I could give to him, of anything that I could offer, of anything that I would have to give up, is he not worthy of that? Okay. I had to think about that. Didn't take long, because he is. <laughs> so the question is, um, well, I, I was thinking about that, and it wasn't in like a manipulative or a transactional way, just to be clear. Um, it wasn't like a, he did this, so you do this. Maybe that's part of it, but that's not how I heard it. I heard it as in light of God's love for you, that he has demonstrated for you, and in light of your love for him, and your trust in him, and your faith in him, and, and who he is, and what he has said he will do. The question that I had before me was, um, it's what will I offer, and it's am I willing to offer it? Am I actually willing? It's one thing to know it, it's one thing to have this knowledge, and it's another thing to actually then offer that to the Lord, for him to do with whatever he will do with it. And in that, we trust we can trust that he is good. He is trustworthy. He is faithful. He is kind. So, my question for you this morning is, what is your next step? <laughs> As you hear all this, 
Um, this week, do you need to maybe do a little self-reflection? <laughs> or is there, um, is there someone that you need to ask about some of your blind spots? Is there someone that you, a trusted friend, that you can offer something that is hidden within you um, and bring it out into the open for healing, for awareness, for development, for whatever, whatever needs to happen with it? Um, do you need to have some of these uh, good conversations with people? Uh, do you need to ask the Lord, who have you designed me to be? Are we that bold to ask God that and then to sit and listen and wait and trust that he is going to answer? Um, and once you have that, um, or the other thing, I guess, once you have that, but also maybe some of you feel like you know that. You know who you are. You know what you have to offer. You know how God has designed you. Um, but the question is, are you willing to offer it? And so the good news for us this morning is that, um, <laughs> that this is going to take faith to offer what we have to God. Um, it's going to take faith to trust the very pieces of who we are, um, our hopes, our dreams, our current situation, um, our history, all of the things. It's going to take some faith, but he's apportioned that to us. And the good news is it requires nothing more, no more faith than what you have today. No more. It's enough. Because God can do a lot with anything that you offer him. And so the question is, are you willing to trust him? Let's pray. Father, as we sit here together, um, hopefully thinking and processing and um, feeling your spirit move. God, I just want to take a minute for us to, to maybe ask, um, ask the first question of who have you designed us to be? Lord, I pray that we wouldn't be afraid of that. But that we would have a posture of curiosity. That we would keep in mind that you have designed us. And Lord, you have equipped us for what you want us to do. And so every part of, our, of who we are today <laughs> that we've brought into this space is usable. And is something to be offered. And so, God, I just pray for us that uh, we would have the faith to trust you with anything and everything that we can make available. God, you're so good and you are kind. I pray that we would know that um, deeply and profoundly. I pray that we would trust you, that we would be a community of people known for how we trust you and how we offer everything that we have. God, you are worthy. We love you, Lord. And it's in Jesus' name that we ask all of these things. Amen.